today's message will come out of the Old Testament from Kings. Uh, it's called Kings and More Kings. Throughout the first and second books of Kings and first and second chronicles, we we find the kingly language, lineage, lineage, excuse me, lineage of Israel. The history of these kings show without any whitewashing the failures and successes that they achieved, and more often than not, they often, as often stated throughout these books, did evil in the sight of the Lord. We know David was a man after God's own heart, but even with all his efforts to do God's will, even he succumbed to the desire of wanting his own way and killing to cover up his sin, as is in the case of his impregnating Bathsheba, while her husband Uriah was off serving in battle for Israel and for King David. He sent him off again to fight in the, on the front lines to be killed, and as such became the case. The child from this affair grew up and became king of Israel, Solomon. He is considered to be the wisest king of all Israel. And still yet, eventually, his 700 wives, 700 wives, turned his heart from God. After Solomon's death, the kingdom was divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, Judah. Kings and more kings. There were some 40 kings during those years, and as I've stated earlier, more often than not, they were evil and, and didn't follow after God. Of those 40, there were about nine that could have been considered good or mostly good kings. Of these nine, nine, eight were in Judah. They were Asa, Jehoshaphat, Joash, Amaziah, Uzziah, Jotham, Hezekiah, and Josiah. In Israel, the northern kingdom, there's Jehu. Well, he was not good, but he was better than the others. In all, it does not seem like a very good track record for the king's faithfulness to the Lord. It seems that there were just, just enough kings to serve the Lord that the king, that the people were not utterly without a godly reminder that a ruler could serve God. In my study for this message, I discovered that each king, at the end of their reign, just before he died, he, he turned from serving and honoring the Lord. They lived the end of their lives in pride and rejection of God's commands. Even the best of them chose to ignore the, the Lord's commands and exhortation through the prophets he would send them. Kings and more kings. And that is what we are to him. Kings and more kings. Kings who rule and reign on this earth as his representatives. How do we rule our own lives? Do we set examples for others to follow? Do the decisions we make Please, our King of Kings. Throughout the books of Kings and Chronicles, some of the good kings did much good in restoring this, the temple for service and, and, and to God. They brought in gold and silver to help furnish the temple to its original glory. They removed the altars to, to foreign gods that they would set up in the temple, but throughout the land they did not get rid of or tear down the high places. Now this is what they refer to when they talk about the altars of other gods, the, the Asherah poles and the altars to Baal. But there was one king, Manasseh. He, uh, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people in 2 Chronicles 33, 10. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people and but they paid no attention. So the Lord brought against them the army commanders of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh prisoner, put a hook in his nose, bound him with bronze shackles, and took him to Babylon. In his distress, he sought the favor of the Lord, his God, and, and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. And when he 
prayed to him, the Lord was moved by his entreaty and listened to his plea. So he brought him back to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. Then Manasseh saw that, knew that the Lord is God. And afterward he rebuilt the outer wall of the city of David, west of Jehon, a spring in the valley as far as the entrance of the fish gate and encircling the hill of Ophel. He also made it much higher. He stationed military commanders in the fortified cities in Judah. He got rid of the foreign gods and removed the image from the temple of the Lord, as well as the altars he, he had built on the temple hill in Jerusalem. He threw them all out of the city. He restored the altar of the Lord and the, sacrifice, and the sacrificed fellowship offerings and thank offerings on it. He told Judah to serve the Lord the God of Israel. The people, however, continued to sacrifice at the high places, but only to the Lord their God. The other events of Manasseh's reign, including his prayer to God and the words the seer spoke to him in the name of the Lord, the God of Israel, are written in the annals of the kings of Israel. His prayer was how God was moved by his entreaty, as well as all his sins and unfaithfulness, and all the sites that he had built, high places and set up, Asherah poles, before he humbled himself. He did tear down the high places. Do we tear down the high places in our life? Now what we really need to see here is that the worship of these foreign gods were strictly forbidden when he, when he said, and still says, they have no other gods before him. He meant, now we don't worship other gods in the way they did then. They literally hung their hopes on, onto those foreign gods to, to save them in times of trouble and sickness. They looked to them in their times of desperation with a tenacity we should be filled with when seeking God's face and will for our lives. They, sacrifice, they offered sacrifices they often needed to eat for their own survival. But those gods were blind to their needs because, what? They didn't exist. <laughs> the Lord wanted his people who are called by his name to know and to experience that trusting him would end up in success and victory when faced with the trials of life that are common with us all. The king in us wants us to rule with dignity and faithfulness when adversity strikes. He wants us to know that he is Lord, that Jesus is Lord, and that as we trust him in all things, that he will prove himself to be true in every man a liar, for it is to the heart that yearns for him to be seen, will that trust develop and become a way of life. I'm proud to be a part of this family of God. And I know that there are among us, we have no other gods before us. We may have things that steal our time and our attention from being with him in prayer and worship. But those are not the things we we worship. Those are not the things we cling to for joy and fulfillment. They are not what we expect them to do to death. They won't expect them to aid us in this battle of life. Distractions are one thing, but what we cling to, adhere to, and rely on to get us through the trials of our souls is the Word of God. Sometimes 